Chicago Disability Studies Conference, March 13, 2015. Keynote panel featuring Lex Ferdan, Rod Ferguson, Jim Charlton. Moderator, Neely Breuer. So after a great first panel, uh, I'm excited to uh, move to the second panel, the keynote panel. Um, my name is Neely, Neely Breuer. I'm a PhD student in the Disability Studies program here at UIC and also a member in the Disability Studies Student Council. Uh, with us today are three very influential figures uh, who their work helped to shape uh, what we may call disability rights, disability justice, and or, uh, social justice at large. And we asked them to share with us their experience and critical thought on the subject of, of justice, disability, and creating conditions. So uh, I would like to, re to present, and I'm honored to present our three speakers for today. Uh, Lex Frieden is professor of biomedical informatics and of physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. He is also director of the ILRU, Independent Living Research Training and Technical Assistance Program at TIRR Memorial Urban Hospital. He has served as chairperson of the National Council on Disability President of Rehabilitation International and chairperson of the American Association of People with Disabilities. Freedom was in instrumental in conceiving and drafting the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and is with us today on Skype. Hi, Alex. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I can see you. And, the second speaker is James I. Charlton. He's the Executive Vice President of Access Living in Chicago and a Research Assistant Professor in the Department of Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Charlton research examines the relationship between oppression and specifically disability oppression and resistance less empowerment, including veiled acts of resistance. He is a frequent lecturer in the United States and abroad on many aspects of disability and the disability rights movement. He is also the author of Nothing About Us Without Us, Disability oh. Oppression and Empowerment. Yes. <laughs> I have one fan. <laughs> you have more, but we are only quiet. <laughs> Last but not least, <laughs> uh, uh, Rodrick A. Ferguson is a faculty in the Department of African American Studies and Gender and Women Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His academic interests include African American literature, queer theory and queer studies, classical and contemporary social theory, African American intellectual history, Sociology of, sociology of race and ethnic relations, and black cultural theory. He is the co-editor of the book series called Difference in Incorporated and the ontology Strange Affinities, the Gender and Sexual Politics of Comparative Racialization uh, from 2011. In addition, his most recent book is The Reorder of Things, the University and the Pedagogies of Minority Difference. Uh, we will have uh, three rounds of uh, questions every time uh, the all three of you are going to respond. We have seven minutes for every question for each of you. And let me start with the first question. What is your understanding of social justice? And if and why it is important to promote also disability studies. Lex, can you please start with that question? I will, uh, well, I'll try to address the question. The, uh, 
my first reaction to that when I saw that was this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, subject for the University of Illinois at Chicago. The first time I was introduced to social justice was when I was serving on a committee representing the U.S. Department of Labor at the Organization of Economic uh, Development in Paris, France. And uh, I was there talking about independent living by people with disabilities and the importance of promoting opportunity, the importance of people with disabilities having the opportunity not only to take part in the mainstream of life in their communities, but also to take part in the workplace and to be a part of the, the whole society. And I was speaking about that from the standpoint of non-discrimination and equal opportunity. After I talked for a little bit, they passed the microphone around and, and one of the representatives from Iceland began to talk about the subject matter. And this particular representative didn't seem to be interested in my notions of opportunity, but more interested in the notions of, what he called it, social justice. And he talked about people who were homeless, uh, people with disabilities who were uh, disenfranchised and therefore uh, not part of the society. Uh, he talked about people who were uh, essentially outcasts from the society. And his description of uh, the subject matter really showed me there's another paradigm of disability in the world outside that that we expect to find in the United States. Um, so here I was pretty well steeped in disability rights and uh, independent living, yet learning that in Europe and in other parts of the world, uh, the concept of social justice was an expanded one, one that extended well beyond that which I was familiar with here. So uh, I think social justice uh, to me in the context of the United States really does mean equal opportunity. Uh, and however, I, I will acknowledge that in a broader context, it extends all the way to issues about rights to health care, rights to education, rights to housing. Later on, when I helped to uh, develop a proposal for the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, we essentially expanded our perspective of uh, social justice from that that was focused on the, uh, the competitive uh, paradigm in the U.S. to a more progressive uh, view that was representative of the rest of the world. And I think you'll find that social justice, as we describe it in the broader sense, is really uh, uh, adopted by the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Thank you. And uh, Jim, would you like to continue? Good morning. Uh, first, I wanted to say thanks to the organizers of the conference for putting this together and also for inviting me. Okay. When I think of social justice, I think of it as three different things. I think of it as a state or a condition. I think of it as a goal. And I think of it as a process. Within that, I posit three elements that constitute the state or condition of social justice. One, everyone is of equal value. Two, everyone having a life worthy of human dignity. And three, equality among all people. Equality understood as attending equally to everyone's different needs, not, for instance, treating everyone equally. The first one comes from many of the articles I've written on commodification, valuation, where I argue that under commodity production or capitalism, everybody or everybody and everything 
is valued differently based on their, their or its capacity or perceived capacity to produce surplus value or produce profits. The second comes from Martha Nussbaum's book, Frontiers of Justice, Capability Theory, Frontiers of Justice, Disability, Nationality, and Species Membership. And the third comes from Terry Eagleton's book, Why Marx Was Right. So from these starting points, I want to make six claims about social justice. One, I believe social justice is unlikely, if not impossible, except under the rarest of circumstances, considering the way in which value works in today's world. The dominate, dominance of value, or valuation. Two, in many ways it seems to me the question isn't social justice, but social justice for who? The insider or the outsider? And believe me, the insider has all the social justice they need. <coughs> I reject theories of justice that center notions of impartiality or neutrality and a unitary moral subject. I start when I'm thinking about social justice from the point of view of excluded groups, about decision making, cultural expression, and division of labor. Most justice theorists assume and homogenous public. I don't assume that. I reject that the public is homogenous. They also fail to consider institutional or structural arrangements for including people or excluding people not culturally identified with white European male norms and privilege. Power relations or more probably accurately, unequal power relations. Social justice is a struggle between oppressed groups and privileged social groups, especially what I would call the ruling class that lives off oppression, especially exploitation. Three, if so, meaning social justice is impossible, why do I fight for it? It's a worthy goal. Something to build social movements around. Something that a lot of people want or believe in. It's fair, whatever fair might be. And it provides an adequate account between the values of self-determination or self-realization on the one hand and community on the other. It seems to me that the fight for or struggle for social justice centers social groups and gets away from individuals. Four, as a political project and as a process, I think the struggle for social, social justice has to be an inclusive participatory process that is radic radically egalitarian and uses self-determination as its center. And the recognize is that some people or some groups will win while others will lose. Social justice is a process, it's not a thing, and it's a, it's a process of gaining more social justice. Five, you cannot promote or we cannot promote social justice in a vacuum much like disability rights. What is the relationship between social justice and disability justice is problematized in the struggle for justice itself. And six, I've argued in many places, in Nothing About Us Without Us, but also other articles, that justice not only has to center on social determinization, determination, 
but it has to develop a politics and program around it where people are, groups are, not only demanding, but fighting for control of what they need. Thank you. There, six and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks, Neely, for organizing and for inviting me. Um, in terms of my own sense of uh, social justice, I would say that it hinges on two um, senses of redistribution. One is a sense of redistribution that really comes from um, the theorist Jacques Rancière, um, who talks about redistribution in terms of the change of meanings of things. You know, the sort of upturning of the sensible, the sort of taken for granted, the uh, assumed meanings of things. And so this gets at, for me, redistribution as a process of changing the value and the meanings of something, of communities, of people, you know, Jim was uh, gesturing towards this, you know, in his remarks, in an effort to disrupt the everyday meanings of especially forms of minority difference, you know, whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about sexuality, whether we're talking about class, whether we're talking ab about disability. Now, the other sense of redistribution for me um, is a kind of classic political sense of redistribution, that is the sort of uh, Marxist and revolutionary sense of the category of redistribution. Redistribution has to be about creating spaces for the pathologized, for the maligned, for the glad-handed, the minoritized. This sense of redistribution calls for a conscious and deliberate change in the social and institutional makeup of things. So here we can kind of see, you know, um, you know, if we were to sort of go back in time and reread our linen, you know, it is the sense of you know politics as both an intellectual and a uh, socially transformative endeavor, right? Um, now, for the for me, these two senses of redistribution are not unrelated. You know, I've always thought that a paradigm shift in how we think about minoritized people necessarily intends a social and institutional shift as well. You know, think here of the great uh, ethnic studies, women's studies movements of the 60s and 70s. One of the first things that people, students, activists, scholars did was to create new syllabi, right? And then what followed after, so the creation of new syllabi, meaning then the reorganization of knowledge for different fields and also the creation of different types of knowledges uh, and the birth of different types of fields. That was then tied to the insistence that institutions had to change to create spaces for those folks who were previously excluded, right? You know, so again, a kind of intellectual shift, then necessitating an institutional and social shift. So those, for me, are you know, part of you know, my own sense of social justice. And I think your next question has to do with disability, so I'm going to pull up. No, no, it's the oh. same question. Oh, OK, it's the same question. All right. All right, so um, <coughs> disability justice, uh, for me, has to presume both these senses of redistribution, a change at the level of meaning and a change at the level of social and institutional makeup. So you know. Um, one way of thinking about this would be, you know, so if we took like, you know, Rosemary Garland Thompson's extraordinary bodies, you know, as a sort of first sense of redistribution, what does that then necessitate in terms of an institutional change or makeup, right? Um, and I mentioned um, Rosemary because she was actually one of my undergrad teachers. <laughs> um, uh, so you can't have a change in the meanings of disability without the critical presence of disabled folks themselves, right? Um, so again, a reorganization of knowledge that is dialectically tied to a reorganization of social and institutional possibilities where disabled people are concerned, right? You know, so for me, that is the exciting um, adventure about you know social justice. You know how it requires both a kind of intellectual and, re and epistemological reorganization, 
but then also then should activate us to figure out how should institutions and social settings change you know, to match up with that intellectual reorganization. Thank you. Uh, we will continue with the second questions. What does coalition mean to you? Can you please share with us part of your own experience of working within a coalition? Lex, do you want to start or anybody else? Uh, Lex? Okay, uh, glad to do that. I think we should have reversed the order and having these uh, scholars speak uh, before I do because I'm inclined to talk more about the practical applications of the uh, brilliance that they've described here. Jim Charlton is uh, one of the most uh, accomplished uh, disability scholars uh, in, in my generation and uh, what he's uh, contributed to the literature, particularly the history of uh, Not About Us Without Us, uh, is really significant. And uh, Rob's uh, broader sense of uh, social justice uh, gives us a great background for discussing coalition, I think. Um, you all may be interested in an article that was just published in the Houston Law Review that I did called uh, Roots of the Movement that Produced the ADA. And that article is all about uh, coalition and coalition building. Uh, the ADA really was a product of at least two decades of organizing by people with disabilities. It was based, I think, largely on the movement that produced the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but perhaps more significantly at the time on the anti-war movement that uh, sprung out of the uh, uh, Vietnam War. And uh, the women's movement came from that, and so did uh, Ralph Nader's consumerism movement, I believe. Uh, the disability movement was spawned largely by individual experiences of people with disabilities uh, spots of facing discrimination around uh, the country in different places at Roberts in California, Judy Human in New York, uh, myself in Houston and, and uh, at that time in Oklahoma and other folks as well. And we all began to meet and share our experiences and uh, as a result of the work that we were doing in local communities, uh, we decided there would be a greater power to our movement if we were to coalesce. And uh, therefore, we started the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities in 1974. Uh, the first formal meeting was in 1975 in Washington, D.C. In building our coalition, which we thought was necessary to reach our objective of uh, equal <coughs> opportunity legislation and non-discrimination law, we. Uh, we had to deal with existing organizations. Uh, among those organizations in the disability movement were some very powerful, very well-funded groups like the uh, National uh, Federation of the Blind, the American Council of the Blind, the National Association of the Deaf, the Paralyzed Veterans of America, and uh, so on. And we were concerned that these uh, legacy groups uh, which had all the money and they had all the recognition. Uh, we were concerned that they would dominate the discussion. And we didn't want that to happen because they were single disability, single focus organizations. So we built our coalition around a model where those groups had representation and to some extent representation based partly on the number of members that they had in their organization. But we also built a role for regional and state coalitions, and we provided incentives in the organization for those groups that came together into regional and state coalitions, and our baseline membership were local organizations. And it was interesting to see how people worked politically within the coalition. They learned a lot about politics internally before we stepped outside the group. Uh, for example, in Houston, we organized five local organizations. We, they were paper organizations. They were incorporated. 
they have mission statements. They were made up of people with disabilities. And uh, the reason we did that was so that when we went to the national coalition meeting, we had five votes, but not one, from our community. Uh, five votes made us as powerful as the National Association of the Deaf when it came to counting votes, because they too had five votes since they were a national organization. We learned a lot about politics, and we learned a lot about negotiation. And later on, we expanded our coalition to include groups of women and groups of uh, African Americans and other minorities. Uh, I can give you another personal experience to help you understand how you translate this issue of coalition and social justice to a broader population. In 1968, uh, uh, sorry, 70, 1978, I was a delegate to uh, the Democratic uh, State Convention, and uh, I wanted to be a representative of the, uh, uh, I think it was Mr. Bondale who was running for the uh, presidency against uh, President Reagan. It could have been 79, sometime in the late 70s. Um, I went to the coalition, and uh, I was a uh, representing people with disabilities. That was my platform, and I made it all the way to the state convention. At the state convention, the Democratic Caucus met on the stage of the auditorium. The stage was not accessible. I could not get on the stage to join the caucus meeting. I went to the foot of the stage, out in front, and I started complaining by myself. How can you have a representative meeting without all of the delegates present? And the chairman said, well, it won't make any difference. We've already organized the vote. We know who the slate will be. And I said, but I'd like to participate in the discussion, and I'd like to nominate myself. <laughs> and the chairman said, that won't be necessary. We've already got the slate filled. Well, I wasn't happy, and I just sat there, and I stared. And a few minutes later, three women came up and stood next to me. And after that, four more women came. And after a while, there were 12 women and myself at the foot of the stage, pounding on the stage, causing a great commotion. And I learned that these women represented the lesbian front in the <laughs> Democratic Party. And they all had decided the ones who were on the stage came off the stage. Other women from the women's movement were, broadly speaking, came down and joined me. And before it was over, the chairman actually had to give up his seat to the state convention uh, for me so that there would be enough slots available for those who wanted to be elected. Just shows you that coalition and practice actually works. It worked for the disability movement, and it worked in politics in 1979. Uh, thanks for giving me the time. Gee, thanks, Lex, for those kind words that date us back to the late 1970s. <laughs> yeah, you're even older than I am. Maybe. So in addressing this subject, I guess I can divide it into two parts. First off, there are these coalitions in which disability activists and the disability rights movement works within other coalitions, other broader political coalitions. The other is the coalitions within the disability rights movement itself. Right? And they're different, and they work differently, and the challenges are different. Um, I think there are some similarities, but the challenges are different. One thing that, that happens in both are both kinds of coalitions are messy. But just because they're messy doesn't mean that we shouldn't engage in them or work in them. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, we need to work in both these kinds of coalitions. I'm going to, though, restrict my remarks to the disability movement and within the disability movement. Okay. And I'm going to give like maybe three examples that, that speak to strategic differences or strategic disagreements orientation, political orientation within the movement, and orientation around organizing within the movement. So the first one is this idea of strategic disagreements within the movement, within disability rights movement. 
In many ways, this is a natural thing. A lot of people get all upset about it. Oh, there's so many differences. Well, that's the case within all social movements. In some ways it's healthy, in some ways it's problematic. Because these reflect different political or ideological tendencies within the movement. And all movements should hope to have a variety of different political or ideological points of view in it. <coughs> Nevertheless, these uh, raise their ugly head at times and movements that have a lot of problems. So within the disability rights movement, there's all sorts of issues where these dis disagreements or different points of view arise. Around health care reform, around education, around housing, where political and class orientations informs one's perspectives or activist perspectives on how expansive the problem is and how expansive the solution needs to be. Um, a good example might be education. Most disability-related activists and demands involve equal access to education. We want education just like everybody else. We say that students with disabilities should be educated in regular classrooms. Well, progressives and leftists within the disability rights movement will go further. We say the entire educational system, especially in urban areas, but we can say this all over, and especially where race and class are crucial informants, is a mess. That the overall education system is a reflection of the overall priorities of the system. And that most students are getting a poor education. We say that inclusion and integration is just one of the fundamental structural change that needs to occur in education. Essentially, quality of opportunity in education is a very limited demand. So then there is this idea of differences within the disability rights movement in terms of control and orientation of the movement. Lex talked about this. For example, a host of individuals from social service and government backgrounds have made a career out of those programs, special schools, rehabilitation agencies, clubs, and so on, that have been set up for people with disabilities, not by people with disabilities. As an activist began to demand a central role in all the decision making regarding disability, and, and, embrace the, and also demanded that the disability movement embrace the civil rights agenda, antagonisms developed. The old guard types rejected the politics and militancy of a young movement, and this is, was the case in the early 1980s, and certainly still is the case today. The politics in the main of the disability rights movement that subjected those forces to a certain kind of criticism. It hurt a lot of people's feelings and drove some of those people out of the movement for better and for worse. These kind of divisions are complicated. Especially if you want, you're starting with, from little, and especially if you're starting from a community that's disappeared or a very big minority, a very big minoritized community. For example, the role of parents of disabled kids. Parents of disabled kids have a long history of advocacy in some fields, especially, for instance, in education. They believe they have a moral authority in this field, mainly because they are kids and they themselves have put up with so much shit in the education system. Obviously, parents play a vital role in education at all levels of education, but their orientation and the orientation of the disability rights movement often diverge. Many disability rights activists, for instance, have come out of segregated schools. They know that those schools need to be closed. These schools, if they were to be closed, would not be closed without a certain risk. Disability activists, whatever the particularities of the disability movement, sees a larger people. People with disabilities must be integrated into everyday life with or without risk, with or without support. Uh, Jenna talked about this in an early presentation about risk dignity of risk. 
Parents most often do not buy into this business of risk or dignity of risk. Because they have too much to be risked. The third example I give you around this is uh, the way in which CILs or Centers for Independent Living have developed over the years. <coughs> now, Centers for Independent Living started, Lex and I can you know, go back to this, you know, to the late 70s. Well, even you could go back to 72, but let's say even to the late 70s, early 80s, that's when I became involved in CILs. In the very early stages, CILs were a very radical departure from what was. And what was is mainly these government agencies that I talked about, social service agencies that I, got, that I talk of, uh, that other people have also talked about. And over the last 30 years, there's much, there's a lot of good news to report. There's been a lot of progress. That's the good news. The bad news is that for the most part, our community is still more or less uh, incredibly marginalized. Extreme isolation, rampant unemployment, poor education, continuing discrimination, neglect, abuse, on and on and on. The fact remains that people with disabilities, not only in the U.S., but everywhere else, are still the most marginalized and unorganized sector of society. How has the CILs evolved over time as progress has been made but also for in lots of individuals, but not for the group. The tendency has been within CILs to become more and more conservative instead of more and more militant. And this is a problem. I've written about this problem in many places. Um, but I, I want to kind of close this section with a, a piece. Time is up. <laughs> I'll get to that in the next question. <laughs> All right, let's see, um, my first experience with Coalition actually came when I started as a graduate student um, at the University of California, San Diego. This was 1994 and I was coming from Washington, D.C. Um, I had recently graduated from Howard University and there was this ballot initiative on a proposition on the California, um, on the California uh, ballot. And it was uh, this proposition, Proposition 187, which was the proposition that said that immigrants and their children would not have access to, um, you know, public education, health care, uh, what have you. I thought it was the most absurd thing in the world, right? And I thought that, oh, there's no way this is going to pass because it's so patently fascist. And then it passed overwhelmingly. Right? And then I thought, where the hell am I? Right? And then, so that was 1994. In 1996, there was another proposition, Proposition 209. Um, and that was the anti affirmative action <coughs> proposition. Well, that passed too. And so, um, what I saw at UC San Diego, which at the time was a campus made up of, you know, very visible. Um, Chicano students, you know, Asian American students, uh, of course, white students, and you know, small percentage of African American students. What came about, you know, in response to the passing of 187 and 209 were the, uh, these amazing coalitions, you know, between those groups, um, and you know, so that also began to sort of shape my own sense of what it meant to be a coalitional person you know, a coalitional political subject. Uh, this was also the moment after, um, you know, the sort of national liberation struggle um, in the 60s and 70s. It was the moment in which you saw the emergence of a kind of post-colonial and women of color feminism on that campus. You know, so in particular, you know, folks like Lisa Lowe um, in Asian American studies, Lisa Yonayama in Asian studies, uh, Rosemary George in post-colonial studies, all of whom were asserting you know, the needs for students and faculty to form coalitions, but not to presume that coalitions were about putting together one monolithic group with another monolithic group, 
You know, so part of their own sort of feminist intervention, it goes back to you know, a bit of what you know, Lex was getting at, was to get people to see the heterogeneity within those groups so that uh, what was actually taking place um, was the sort of coming together of groups constituted by heterogeneity. You know? So it wasn't simply that the coalitions were about you know, sort of producing diversity between groups, but also observing the diversity within those groups. So, you know, so I became a part of, um, you know, efforts to, you know, try and rest, you know, some parts of affirmative action after it had been devastated, you know, on the campus. Other friends of mine uh, did work in uh, the Makilla Daughters uh, movement, um, you know, to uh, support, uh, especially Mexican women who were disfranchised by, um, you know, the emergence of NAFTA, you know, things like that. It put me in the position of always trying to be the student, you know, to, you know, Jackie Alexander has this nice um, phrase and where she says, you know, we have to become fluent in each other's narratives. And so there was a way in which the kind of coalitional work that was being produced at that moment was really giving me a training in how to become fluent in other people's narratives and help them create their narratives and also allow them to help me create my own narratives, right? And so that was something that really informed um, my encounter with disability studies, um, you know, as a sort of, you know, fully constituted field, you know, when I received it. And that was, you know, sort of in the moments when I had left graduate school and um, started as a junior faculty member at the University of Minnesota in the Department of American Studies. And so, you know, I would get students, you know, who, you know, disability studies was at their core, and they said to me, would you advise me? And I would say to them, okay, but you have to understand, you're going to teach me, you know? And so that was also one of the things that I learned from my time at UC San Diego, that if you're going to have a really robust coalition, you know, you can't, um, you know, sort of raise the ramparts of your ego. Like, you've got to really be willing, you know, to be taught by others. And so when, um, and so I mentioned that to also say that, you know, my own sort of coalitional development around disability studies, you know, was, you know, through these students, but also through, you know, fellow colleagues, like, you know, Robert McCruer, Kathy Kudlick, um, you know, who really, you know, were giving me a kind of language to think about how to marry my own interests with disability studies and see disability studies as a really dynamic and ever-changing you know, field. So here I am at you know, Illinois Chicago um, co-chairing a search you know, for the research cluster, hiring cluster that I co-direct, the racialized body cluster, the search is on race and disability. You know, at this moment. So, you know, the task is then to, you know, how do we find candidates around the country who can do and embody the kind of coalition work that we want to see, you know, both within critical ethnic studies and also within disability studies. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what uh, the three of you have said so far, and it, it's like the the messy of coalition uh, is kind of brought up for me. Also, how we thinking of the narrative of there is a group that created, and only after we can create the coalition. And I think it's happening in between, it's like happening together. The coalition also creates a separation for different uh, groups that continue to develop by reflecting what the differences between the groups in a coalition. So it's like the messy part, continue to work and create a coalition and separations for group in the same time. Uh, we will go through the third question. Uh, how do you grapple with the issues of politics and power within coalitions? Do you have any specific insight on the subject that could promote better practices? 
principle, mission, investment, and leadership. Those are four characteristics of an effective coalition. You know, people often think they've accomplished a lot when they actually are able to define a coalition. These groups are working together, we are a coalition. Uh, but more often than not, such coalitions will achieve very little. Uh, they, they may be able to write some letters and represent multiple groups in the process, but as far as making effective change uh, in policies and programs, they won't achieve very much because they don't have uh, a common principle, they don't have a common mission, uh, they don't have a common investment in the outcome, and they don't have the kind of leadership necessary to move forward consistently. That's one thing we learned when we put together the American Association of uh, People with Disabilities. Um, we needed to have a principle, a mission, a coalition that was invested, and leadership. And I'm not sure we've achieved that yet with AAPD. Uh, the old group, the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities, started with people who were not quite as familiar with coalitions. And we had to sort of find our way through it. And one of the ways we did that was by spending a lot of time together. The leadership went to one another's homes, uh, one another's communities, and they stayed in one another's homes. Uh, the leadership of the ACCD in the 70s uh, came to my home in Houston. And and Fred Faye slept on the floor. He was a quadriplegic. Uh, he, he, he needed help uh, getting dressed and undressed and getting up and down off the floor. And the people who helped him were blind and they were deaf. And, and uh, you know, we learned to work together. The person who provided my personal assistance in St. Louis when we stayed at the home of Jenny Laurie there uh, was a blind individual named Roger Peterson. And I had to explain to him and learn to, to verbalize uh, things that I would expect a, a person ordinarily to be able to see. And I learned a lot from that process. And, and Eunice Fiorito, who was the blind individual who led our coalition, uh, was a, a powerful orator, a great speaker. And uh, one time Eunice asked me to describe something to her that we were looking at. And, and I learned how to provide description to a person who was blind, and that's helped me throughout my life to articulate scenes better to other people, maybe not who were blind, but those who may not have been at a certain place that I was, and I could describe in visual terms what was there. Uh, I learned how to sign. Even though I can't move my fingers, Fred Schreiber, who founded the National Association of the Deaf, uh, helped me learn to sign only with my hands, and he gave me a sign uh, for my name Jim knows me well enough to understand the, the sign Fred gave me. It was cheap. Uh, Fred had been to dinner with me a few times and uh, I'm pretty conservative when it comes to the menu. So in any case, uh, we learned a lot about one another, but we learned about our values. And we learned that we had certain principles that all of us had in common. And we dedicated ourselves to those principles, and then we agreed on a certain mission. And the mission had a product, an outcome, and we also understood that once we achieved our mission, once we had reached the outcome that we had set for ourselves, then in order to move forward, we needed to have a new mission and a new outcome, or we needed to disband. And that's exactly what happened to the ACCD. And about 1983, after we'd achieved what we wanted to achieve, the organization disbanded because we never could find another mission that was equal to the one we took in the first place. Um, it was a very important and insightful learning experience for me, but I will say this. If it were not for the leadership of first Eunice Fiorito and Fred Fay, and then later Frank Bowe, ACCD would have achieved very little. So when you think about coalition, you think of this egalitarian organization, this egalitarian group, and those of us who are social activists seem to like to talk about egalitarianism so much. But in reality, that organization, and I think few other coalitions, would have achieved as much as it did and might going forward as an organization that has strong leadership. Leadership that is respectful of everyone's views, but leadership who maintains a focus on those common principles, the mission with an outcome, and respect for one another. That leadership must be outspoken, 
It must be strong and it must keep the group together, focused on the principles. Uh, you know, that's been my experience, and, and uh, I suspect there are other experiences people could report. Uh, but I'm convinced that the strength of the coalitions of which I have joined and been a member of, including those that helped to get the, the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, were all firmly based on shared principle and mission. So this question asks about insights. So that's, that's a problem right there. Okay, I can't claim that these are, my comments are insights, all right? So just wanted to make sure everybody gets that. Um, it seems to me that coalition politics revolve, or I would more say evolve, or tend to evolve as a reflection of how the politics of the broader society evolve or revolve. If the broader society tends to become more militant or radical or resistant, social movements tend to do so and the same way if the world or the local or the social or society becomes more conservative. And I think that that's pretty much what's happened in the U.S. disability movement, uh, which I want to say a few words about this evolving kind of politics. Um, I will use, as I was closing on the last question, the example of Centers for Independent Living, which I know a lot about. So in the beginning, the philosophy of and development of Centers for Independent Living in the U.S. emerged, right, they emerged out of the late 60s, early 70s, where very many things were challenged, very many things were um, thought about in new ways, including disability. And it's not uh, a random fact or something totally random that the Centers for Independent Living and in many ways, the contemporary disability rights movements can be dated back to the early 70s in Berkeley, Berkeley and in Boston, to, and maybe even Ann Arbor. You know, I mean, there's something that was going on in those places that helped give rise to something in the disability community. And in those early days, CILs were a radical break from the past and from from traditional agencies. The philosophy that we had stressed self-help, rights, community control, and ideology of empowerment. And this ideology drew activists, or people who wanted to become activists, into Centers for Independent Living Networks. Today, this is not the case, or not as much of the case. In fact, many Centers for Independent Living disdain politics. They don't hire politically active people, they do not have organizers, and have no strategic view of how to make social change. This starts at the top. Many executive directors of CILs are apolitical, hired because they have experience in social service agencies, and oblivious to the necessity of social change. Hence, there is very little mobilization of people around race, class, and gender which it seems to me here, again, going back, you can't, to me, fight for disability rights unless you don't fight for other kinds of rights, human rights, civil rights. Some centers even avoid demonstrations because they're outdated, or worse, because they would alienate funding sources. This is just an example. Those things would never have happened in the early 1980s because the times are different. The times are different now. And it seems to me the times that we live in today challenge the way in which disabil disability coalition politics evolve or revolve. And it seems to me that the greatest challenge for the disability rights movement, in some ways is the same for many other disability, uh, other social movements in the present period, and that is what political line leads the disability movement or leads these other social movements. 
And here's why I think social justice is critical. Do, does the disability rights movement fight for individual rights, which emphasize the individual, or does it fight for social justice, which emphasizes social, ex excluded social groups? So that's why I think conferences like this that talk about social justice are so important, because we need to fight against the tendency, especially the present tendency, to fight only for individual rights when, when social justice can call into something much broader. Thank you. Yeah, let's see. <clears throat> um, you know, for me it has to do with the distinction between those groups that are willing to sort of um, extend what I was attributing to um, feminism, particularly women of color feminism, right? And that is the sort of observation of, you know, sort of heterogeneity, diversity, you know, within the groups, you know, rather than presuming that, again, it's one monolithic group coming together with another monolithic group, you know, which in, you know, are really about, like, this interest group coming together with that interest group. When I think about, you know, um, what made um, the sort of coalitions that were produced at San Diego um, so meaningful, you know, and so rich, is that, you know, people were not trying to um, present, you know, a group as a monolith with a monolithic interest that inevitably would be in competition with the other group that is supposed to be, you know, in coalition with, right? You know, so again, you know, how to become fluent in each other's narratives and also how to share, you know, a politics, right? When I think about the groups that failed that I was a part of um, in terms of coalition, you know, it was like, you know, a monolithic, our monolithic group will come together with your monolithic group, will come together with this monolithic group, you know, um, not to share a sort of political vision, but to, you know, there is strength in numbers, so we'll get our resources, and you'll get yours. I mean, you know, that's not an alternative model at all. That's actually nationalism. You know, that's the UN. That's, you know, Game of Thrones. You know? <laughs> that's actually not what, you know, um, coalition and coalition is meant to be, the sort of production of alternative models you know, for getting together, for um, producing a political vision. It's actually not, you know, about your nation state getting together with our nation state, you know, and um, establishing some multilateral agenda, you know? So the, the groups that I've been a part of, you know, have been the, the, the ones that have succeeded. Succeeded in, in the sense of like, you know what, this produced, alternative practices, this produced, alternative ways of being, that kind of success, those were the groups that were not trying to be the UN, were not trying to be the kingdoms in Game of Thrones, you know? Like, those were the groups that were actually trying to create a broad vision, you know, for social justice, you know? Um, I guess I should just leave it there. <laughs> uh, if anybody want to uh, uh, return back to the questions that we already asked or uh, c comment to each other, so now is the time. And also we can have questions from the audience, <laughs> or comments. So the discussion is opened. complicated 
or I won't mince words. Are we not producing a sort of binary that is not reflective of the way that sort of structural oppression is happening currently? And does this sort of binary between inside and outside not actually prevent the kind of coalitional politics that um, you guys are talking about? So I, I will repeat. Sorry. Uh, I no, no, no. that mess. <laughs> Now it's getting even messier. Uh, so it's a question for you, Jim, uh, about your binary of outsider and insider. Uh, if it's not creating uh, uh, difficulties to actually uh, communicate and cooperate with each other when we we distinct between two two groups. That was a much nicer way of okay. framing that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the way I look at this question of binary is that I don't think social movements create binaries. I think binaries exist. I think the way the system is set up, the way in which individual people are valued or devalued, creates uh, binaries. Um, I often talk about, I kind of run these together, race, class, and gender. I think that these are like deep structures that separate people, um, that separate people structurally. And so I think it's best politically for coalitions to understand that binaries exist. That's why I asked in some ways this question of justice for who? Because I think <coughs> I'm not, I don't care about justice for everybody because there's the 1% I have no interest in being just. They are unjust, right? So in some ways that's what I mean when I think the, so, the struggle for social justice involves some people losing. The privileged few are going to lose. And I, and I think that that's one of the problems that divide kind of a radical egalitarian point of view on social movements and social justice from kind of liberal ones. That the liberal ones see that, well, we can all get ahead. And I don't think that's the case. You know, I think I, sometimes I use the vampire, you know, metaphor. Some of you have heard it. You know, do you go to the vampire and say, please, please, Mr. Vampire, stop sucking my blood. Well, the vampire can't stop sucking your blood. Because if the vampire stops sucking your blood, the vampire is going to die. Right? And so the privileged are sucking the real, the 1% or the one tenth of the women, they're sucking our blood. Right? There is a binary. There's the blood suckers and the blood givers. Right? So I think there's a blood letting. Right? <laughs> Maybe the end of like I mean, the council to stop the blood. <laughs> so it does. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to hear Rod speak, but I've heard Professor Charlton, excuse me, Professor Perkins, Professor Charlton speak um, a lot. And it's interesting that uh, you talk about groups coming together to coalesce. But the individual got lost, even though Professor Palatine's talking about insider and outsider, the individual was lost in this conversation. And it's always such a touchy subject in disability studies to speak about the individual. Um, and I understand the importance of, of bringing together a new group. Uh, to support the individual, uh, 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 much um, like Professor Freeman was mentioning, uh, being at the at the stage and having the women come up and later finding out this was a, a, a activist group of lesbians. Um, but uh, it, it, I think uh, when I was running to St. Paul, uh, I would, you know, St. Paul is you know where I'm going. So, um, uh, you know, I was, for some weird reason, I was always freaked out. And I'm using the F word with a 
entirety of its gravity. And then later on it became angry and freaked out. And then later on it became loudmouth and angry and freaked out. And then later on I had the very good fortune of coming upon a group called Gabriella, which is a very, very active feminist women's group led by Ninochka Rossi. And Ninochka always took a great thing. The first thing she ever said to us at one of, I guess, one of our meetings or the deck or what have you, said, your responsibility now that you're here in your meeting is to become a leader. And as a leader, your first responsibility is to teach somebody else to become a leader. And then, as part of being a leader, you have to find those other groups, those other people that drew groups that drew in other people and gave them safety and gave them opportunity to be an individual in a group. And she said, just take it from there. And so, uh, so first we had to be individuals, then we had to be leaders. And then we could be part of the group. And the purpose of the group was to form a coalition. Um, and the major, one of its major goals was to stop uh, the mail order bride industry, which really didn't take off until people started talking about European mail order brides. Um, but that was okay, you know, uh, ish, um, you know, to, to, to get to start to get to where we needed to go. We, we had to become a parasite on the mail. Never lose the individual. Yeah, no, I can respond. Sure. Um, so the question has to do with what is the place of the individual within a sort of coalitional <coughs> imagination and politics, right? You know, that we talk so much about um, groups, you know, as the sort of main actors of coalitions and what is the status of the individual in this discussion. And, you know, so I would say that, you know, you're absolutely right in terms of you know, coalitions have to have, have to also be about a personal transformation, you know, at the individual level. So when I was saying, you know, for instance, um, that uh, one of the things that the coalitional movements and formations in San Diego taught me, you know, was to become a different type of, you know, really ethical and political subject, an intellectual subject, right? So that was a very personal, transformation that is part of, as I read it, the day-to-day -day of every good coalition, right? That like, you know, I've got to, you know, there's something transformative happening to me in this moment through this project of coalition. You know, I'm thinking about connections that I never thought about before. You know, there's this wonderful um, moment in, um, uh, Barbara Smith's anthology, Homegirls, the Black Lesbian Feminist Anthology, where a group of black lesbian feminists are getting together to talk about these issues that we're talking about now, right? And the day before, there was a, this is like 1983, the day before their discussion, there was a protest at the UN around um, you know, nuclear proliferation, so protesting for nuclear disarmament. One of the things that Smith said that I always found really just moving and profound and gets at what you're talking about, how do I make nuclear disarmament into a black lesbian issue, right? So then part of what she's then saying is that, you know, you know, what does it require for me to turn my attention, you know, to this issue to make it my cause, right? So she's getting at a question that is about personal transformation, the shift at the level of the individual, things I didn't care about before, I didn't think of as my issue, now become mine, right? Um, so in many ways, the best coalitions do, you know, act as kind of technologies that actually change, you know, um, the person, you know, and change the individual so that, you know, again, you're producing associations that did not exist before. I'm a different type of being, you know, after that. Uh, thanks for the question. Great. Um, <laughs>
So, it seems to me that social justice movements have to embody social justice themselves. They have to practice it, right? And so, I wanted to kind of restate what I thought the state or condition of social justice was when I quoted from Terry Eagleton's book, where he says that social justice has to be about equality, equality insofar as attending to people's or individuals different needs, right? Attending equally to, diff to individuals different needs. Right? So it's not like treating everybody the same, but it's attending equally to the, the people, not only now in the social or in society, but also within the movement. So I think that the only way that, mo that movements are vital and are sustained is if individuals feel comfortable in them. And that individuals feel like they're getting something from those, those experiences over time. Because for the most part, social movements don't win anything really quickly. Right? So how do people stay in it? You know, partly it's kind of a commitment to politics, but it's also partly that they feel like they're being treated with respect inside the social movement. Yeah, also, you know, part of this, you know, the answer to this is also to extend, you know, again, another element of feminism, right? And that is the element around the autonomy of the person. Right? You know, so there's that famous quote from Michelle Wallace where she says, you know, everybody's talking about unity, unity. And I always have the sense that my sense is that my ass is going to be the first to get kicked. You know? And so, you know, part of what we have learned, what we can learn and extend from, you know, feminist movements is the autonomy of the person, as you say, the individual, you know, to invent him or herself, you know, and that they're all, that space of invention has to be protected, right? And rather than regulated, you know, which uh, is also characteristic of, you know, many of the social movements that we've talked about. So, you know, part of the answer, it seems to me, has to be in reviving and extending you know, feminism's emphasis on autonomy and the autonomy of the subject. Uh, I kind of have a question uh, regarding the ADA specifically and uh, the 25th anniversary. Um, so, Mary Johnson makes a case that uh, the ADA basically established entitlements and not civil rights, that the law didn't go far enough in terms of a national dialogue. And I'm wondering if, uh, kind of in accordance with justice delayed is justice denied. If we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the ADA, are we helping to, uh, I don't know what a corollary would be for whitewash, but are we helping to whitewash the failures that come with it? Is anybody critically engaging with the failures of the ADA? <laughs> It's a question about limitation of the ADA, but I think you were also more specific, so if... Um, well, no, ask again. Yeah, if you, I will really just uh, repeat the question, sorry. Oh, sure. So, Mary Johnson makes the case that uh, the ADA basically uh, established entitlements and did not broaden the discussion really effectively towards civil rights. And I'm wondering if celebrating the 25th anniversary of the ADA is uh, effectively whitewashing uh, that, uh, that it, it's failures, that you know, if justice delayed is justice denied, that we're celebrating the denial of justice um, to Americans with disabilities. Uh, the ADA is an expansive research a lot of areas and, and a lot of people are affected by it. 
In fact, the whole society is affected by it. And if, you know, I don't know what age you are, but you've obviously grown up during a period of significant uh, social and uh, environmental change related to people with disabilities. Those of us who are old enough to remember how things were before 1990, uh, I think all of us can tell you examples of the radical ways in which our society and our communities and our environment has changed. Um, before 1990, uh, I could apply for a job and an employer could and frankly did tell me that I wasn't qualified uh, and they made that judgment simply by looking at me and determining that I would use the wheelchair. Um, employers are less likely to do that today. Now, there may still be uh, discrimination, but it's certainly not as overt as it was then. It's been conditioned differently. And obviously, employment is one area where we need to make more progress. In that regard, let me just point out that the ADA has no affirmative action provision. So in that respect, it's not equivalent to either the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or to the uh, Section uh, Title V of the, uh, of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which did include uh, a, a, an affirmative action provision. In fact, that affirmative action provision under Section 503 is now effectively being used uh, in some local uh, and state jurisdictions to increase the proportion of people with disabilities uh, who are employed. I'm interested in thinking about the coalition and some of the, the uh, uh, discussion that, that I've heard here, uh, particularly back to Rob's original reference to the uh, movement for equality by certain groups that uh, continues to, to have challenges. Uh, one thing that we observed among African Americans after the civil rights uh, act, and particularly in the late 1970s, was that there seemed to be a systematic effort by intellectuals to bring people who were people of color into the employment offices of uh, businesses and corporations. So there's a period of time in the late 1970s and early 1980s where you can actually look at the uh, at the uh, racial composition of people working in and meeting employment HR offices in corporations across America and see a, 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 an unusually high peak of employment in those offices by African Americans who one would think might quite, quite naturally be inclined not to be prejudiced on the basis of color in hiring, and I think that actually proved to be the case. So I think many people of color actually were hired uh, by large corporations and others during the late 70s and early 80s. Maybe that continues today, I don't know. But we observed that early on, that uh, that kind of almost strategic placement, I don't know whether that was an intended plan or just happened coincidentally, I doubt it. Uh, I, you know, these are the kinds of strategies, though, that I think people with disabilities and the disability movement has failed to exercise. Uh, we haven't really placed a value on getting people with disabilities strategically placed in certain organizations. And when you think about it, HR, when it comes to hiring, is a pretty strategic place to be. So, you know, I, obviously, the ADA has not achieved everything we intended for it to achieve, but it's achieved a whole heck of a lot. And I don't think it's a shame to celebrate the progress that's been made since 1990 in the uh, uh, integration of people with disabilities into our communities and into our society. Uh, what we've been able to do since 1990 is actually create benchmarks along the way so that we can see a major progress and we can see a major failure. And that gives us then the opportunity to target uh, opportunity to target, to target strategies that will enable people to have housing. We know, for example, right now, that one of the main reasons Olmstead is not being uh, in, in, uh, implemented the way it should be is that there is a lack of housing in the community that will accommodate people with disabilities. And the second piece of that is an absence of uh, personal assistance services. These are issues that the disability movement needs to focus more on.
Some already are, but Chicago's a good example. Mark and Jim and others there have focused on the housing and made some progress, but not as much, I think, as they would like to have made at this point in time. Other communities are far behind. Um, you know, again, let me just conclude by saying I think we should celebrate ADA for what it's achieved, and I think we should use the opportunity to point out the gaps that we still have that we need to target. Well, I think this is a great question. So thank you for raising it. Um, because it's very, it's a very unlikely question. Why wouldn't you celebrate the ADA? And I have to say I'm somewhat ambivalent about it. Um, Lex is much more robust than I am about this, this question of celebrating. And I think in many ways what Mary Johnson raised, or what you called attention to what Mary Johnson raised, is pretty interesting. Well, I think there's a difference between limitations and failures. Right? And he used both those words. Um, clearly, the ADA is limited, but I wouldn't sum up that because it's limited, it's failed. So I think there needs to be somewhat of that you know, perspective about it. And it also, the way in which activists understand the ADA and other entitlements, Fair Housing Amendments Act, 504, all of these kind of legal mandates, flows out of the way in which the movement itself or the sections or groups within the movement itself celebrated their passage in the first place. And you will get this, for instance, way in which people even talk about these legal mandates that X or Y legal mandates guarantees blah, blah, blah. And you know, often you hear people talk about the ADA, that ADA guarantees X, Y, and Z. Legal mandates don't guarantee anything. And if you think they guarantee it, then you will sum up that they were failures. Um, to me, that social progress, and this is the case with this uh, community of people with disabilities as well as other minority communities primarily and over, overwhelmingly flow from social struggle. They don't come out of legal mandates. And so when social movement, social struggle is high, there's much, a lot of progress. And when there's an ebb, those, that progress either wanes or there's retrenchment. I mean, we can see this around affirmative action, for instance that there's been take backs. You know, so just because you win, you don't always get to you know, keep it. So, uh, so I would say, A, that there's limitations, but I, would be, I think it's wrong to call it a failure. There is a question of expectations of individuals within the movement, within the community, about what legal mandates can accomplish in and of themselves. I think social, prog uh, social progress is, is primarily product of social struggle and organization, social movements, etc. And I think that celebrating the ADA is a challenge. Like, how do you do it? Do we say things are hunky-dory? <laughs> well, they're not. Somebody knows that. Even the most people who are most, most enthusiastic about the ADA wouldn't say that. Can we say that there's been a lot of progress over the last, well, since 1990, or you can, however you periodize it? Yes. But how much of that do you attribute to the ADA? And among us, because I know almost everybody in the crowd, I can say that we're kind of talking to each other about this. I wouldn't really say this to a public forum of 500 people where I would say I'm ambivalent about the ADA because then they would, people would take that as I'm being critical of the ADA. I think the ADA was an advance. But there's limitations to it, and I also think that this idea that legal mandates guarantee social progress is very, very problematic. So, limitations, yes, failure, no.
only add something on the subject. Uh, uh, to add to, the, to your question, uh, does the, the discourse of uh, right can, the, can take the attention from other alternative for the movement and can uh, construct for the movement only one approach to struggle and kind of uh, kind of put boundaries to, to narratives, to other narrative that can promote the, the movement to other direction. I, I think it's it's a question not to, to ask if this uh, discourse of civil rights or this movement is important of, or, or succeed or fail, but to ask is it uh, put too, uh, too much uh, uh, restriction to alternative politics and to social justice that go beyond social, social uh, rights. I don't know if you want to re react to it, but it was something that I, I wanted to add. Other questions? Other comments? Thank you very much. It was very thought-provoking, and I want to thank the three of your, your speakers for joining us today for this conference. And uh, also for the audience, uh, thank you very much. And I do hope you will stay for the next uh, panel, the last panel that we will finish the conference with. Uh, so we have a break and we soon return. Thanks. 2015 Chicago Disability Studies Conference. Organized by the Disability Studies Student Council. Co-sponsored by UIC Department of Disability and Human Development, UIC Department of English, UIC Department of Women and Gender Studies, and UIC Disability Resource Center.